the title of this debate is Imaging Does Not Influence the Timing of Degenerative Mitral Valve Repair. This will be a very interesting uh, one again. And let's start with, uh, with Marta. Thank you very much. Okay, so I also feel like Dr. Sir is like a little mouse more than uh, a giant. So the, 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 we are going to the debate, the affirmation of imaging does not influence timing of uh, intervention in degenerative mitral valve disease between a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. So I will defend the position that imaging does influence timing of degenerative mitral valve repair, and this is my first conflict of interest. I am a cardiac imager, so definitely I am absolutely convinced that imaging is essential to decide when you have to intervene a patient. The first thing is that for sending somebody to intervention, MR should be severe, and I think we would all agree that probably we will be more likely to send this patient for intervention with a more severe mitral regurgitation, more enlarged left atrial, and probably more hemodynamic impact, despite both might be asymptomatic. But also imaging can quantify the amount of severity or the amount of uh, regurgitation, and this has been, as you well know, correlated with the prognosis. You may say, oh, ECHO is not useful. Who does PISA? Who cares about PISA or any other methods that we use to quantify? Okay, there are upcoming uh, methods that also confirm this ability of uh, the correlation by quantific quantification of mitral regurgitation and outcomes. So definitely imaging, imaging has something to do on classifying the amount or defining the amount of mitral regurgitation. So that's our first step. Also, if we go to guidelines, wherever, European, American, in patients, of course, who have symptoms, we have to, and these symptoms are uh, explained by the presence of severe mitral regurgitation, this patient should be sent to intervention. But when we go to the asymptomatic patient, which is probably the patients that we are debating, again, there are something, some parameters that guide us and are based, again, on imaging, which is ejection fraction and systolic diameter, and even the presence of pulmonary hypertension. So again, uh, the hemodynamic impact is based in imaging. So second thing, based on imaging. And we know that if we follow these guidelines, and this is uh, has been controversial. These are the latest data uh, uh, published by the group of uh, Austria, you know, defending the position of watchful waiting and following these guidelines. Okay, we know that with follow-up, some of these patients, one, uh, 161 out of 280 patients, will go for sur surgery during follow-up because they will develop hemodynamic uh, uh, signs of left ventricular involvement that uh, make us to decide to send them to surgery. But these are not so many patients, and we can effectively detect them if we uh, follow them accurately. And this uh, approach, indeed, when we follow this approach, uh, which is this line in solid orange here, is not so different in outcomes as what would be expected in the reference population in the green line. So this has also proven to be safe, provided we follow these patients adequately. Dr. Chigwe may say, okay, this is useless. We know ejection fraction is not that good, and I agree. We all have patients like this one. This is a patient with degenerative mitral regurgitation, severe, she had symptoms, we sent her to surgery despite the left ventricle was not so bad. You can, we can agree that the ejection fraction here is, looks normal, and this is the outcome after a perfect mitral valve repair. We all agree that we all have patients like this one. And indeed, this is a work from Dr. my colleague, Dr. Quintana and Rakesh Shuri at uh, the Mayo Clinic, showing that there are a quite important proportion of these patients with apparently normal left ventricular function defined by diameters and defined by ejection fraction, and thereafter even the surgery is 
perfect, they develop left ventricular uh, reduction, sorry, they, they show reduction in postoperative ejection fraction. But we know, echocardiographers know, that ejection fraction is indeed a measure of desesperation, and indeed we should not be relying on it because we know that when, uh, when there is progressive left ventricular dysfunction, the first thing uh, that goes down because of the disposition of the myocardial fibers is longitudinal deformation of the, eject, uh, of the left ventricle. So the first impairment is on the endocardial fibers and the longitudinal deformation of the, uh, of the left ventricle. But this is what ejection fraction is not measuring. What happens with this? that the circumferential fi fibers try to compensate this uh, decreased longitudinal deformation. So ejection fraction, which is measuring the radial uh, motion of the left ventricle, is still preserved. So normal ejection fraction is not equal to normal uh, ventri left ventricular function. So we should go for a more comprehensive approach of, in assessing left ventricular function. And this has been uh, really shown in the last decade. This is more recent data showing the value of other evaluations of left ventricular function using myocardial deformation, myocardial strain. And we, now we have current te currently technology that makes us very easily to measure global longitudinal strain, which has shown in several studies to add prognostic value and to clearly differentiate patients who are going to have a good versus a bad prognosis if we don't oper intervene on them. This is also work showing how this adds value on top of uh, other, other, other indications, such as the presence of left atrial dilatation and atrial fibrillation, and while there is indeed no difference between uh, adding ejection fraction. So let's keep on real indicators of ventricular function and forget a little bit of ejection fraction. Also, if we combine these parameters of myocardial deformation with the size uh, of the ventricle, because the, the for myocardial deformation will also depend on the size of the ventricle, and also we add the behavior of the ventricle during exercise, and that's something that we can do really easily in the echo lab during exercise echo. This has been shown to have a much more powerful prediction of outcomes in these patients. So we are really able to do a comprehensive approach of ventricular function much farther beyond of left ventricular function, of left ventricular ejection fraction. Finally, Upcoming uh, imaging modalities are even showing more promising uh, concepts on the evaluation of myocardial function in uh, mitral regurgitation, and this is the case for assessing fi uh, interstitial fibrosis with uh, T1 sequences in cardiac MR, and this is a still work in progress, but I'm sure that in the future this will help us in assessing uh, precisely which are the patients that should, in asymptomatic patients, that should go intervention as early as they have been diagnosed. Indeed, this is uh, foreseen in the guidelines. So this is a class uh, to a indication, as you know now. Uh, patients who are amenable to have a repair, uh, who are um, amenable to be repaired, who have a, a potential to have a, a repairable valve, yes, that's something that we can also accept, uh, provided that we can ensure a durable, feasible, and durable repair with a very low mortality, less than 1%, and that should be done in a center of excellence. Okay, that's good if you're lucky and you have the center of excellence. Again, imaging plays a role, an essential role, because this is the way we have to predict reparability of a valve. First of all, uh, using a systematic approach with uh, a systematic uh, views and the use of 3D, we can really define if a valve is amenable to be repaired in experienced hands, and this is what we, how we really define if a valve is uh, amenable to be repaired or not. 
defining if there is enough, and flexible tissues, defining the mechanism of the regurgitation, and of course, we need an experienced team. But as I have said, this is sometimes far away from our reality. These are data from the UK, you may know this study, and this is the repair rate of the mitral valve in the generative disease according to the hospital volume uh, of cardiac surgeries. And as you can see, there's the wide variability. But even as recognized in this paper from Dr. Chigwe, from the group of Dr. Chigwe, you can see that the repair rate, again, varies among surgeons, not only among centers, but only also among surgeons, depending on the volume due they have. So this is, as they recognize, a complete lottery, depending on your referral surgeon that you have. And they also recognize that in these asymptomatic patients, uh, if, you know, if you don't repair them and you have to replace them, this is really a bad thing because you present much more problems than if you get repair. So I hope that I have convinced you that imaging is the basis for deciding inter intervention in patients with a generative MR. First of all, because the, it's the technique of choice in 2019 to quantify the severity of MR. Secondly, because we can assess the functional anatomy of the valve, so that's the first step to predict reparability. And of course, we are able currently using a comprehensive approach uh, to non-invasively assess left ventricular function, combining all the parameters that we have currently in our imaging tools. So thank you very much for your attention. Very nice. Joanna? Well, while we're waiting for the slides, it's an absolute honor to be in uh, Spain. It's a wonderful meeting. Um, I love talking about mitral valves, but uh, this debate is about as much fun as Brexit for a Brit. Um, I don't know how I got an undefendable topic, and I don't know how I got to debate a, it against an imager of, of the caliber of Dr. Sitkus here. So what I'm going to do instead is slightly modify it. I'm going to say that imaging should not dictate the timing of degenerative mitral valve repair. Um, you all know the data that underpins the guidelines, so starting with... Uh, Maurice's group that um, showed us how the survival of patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation and ERO greater than 40 was substantially worse than that of lesser EROs. And again, the cutoff of an LV ejection, sorry, end systolic diameter of greater than 40, which predicted both worse survival in treated and in operated patients after surgery. And similarly, um, left ventricular ejection fraction, such that if you have patients that have any of those class one indications for surgery, um, the watchful waiting is associated with superior prognosis, as uh, Rakesh demonstrated in this multi-registry uh, analysis of about a thousand patients, half of whom um, waited for surgery for about three months. And this is essentially what underpins our guidelines. We're all very familiar with the class one American and European guidelines for surgery in asymptomatic patients. And I think it's worth just pausing and thinking about these. So if you're sitting in the office with an asymptomatic patient with severe MR in front of you, you have a mandate to operate if their EF is decreased or if their EF, their ventricle is slightly dilated. And that's quite a responsibility because essentially you're deciding to operate on a patient purely on the basis of an image. And the rationale for that is worth looking at a little bit more closely. In asymptomatic patients that have no ventricular dysfunction, we're still de deciding whether to operate purely on the basis of an image. In this case, it's whether the, based on the imaging morphology, we think a successful and durable repair can be carried out safely and reliably. So in order to deliver our evidence-based guideline adherence, we need to know a few things. We, we really need to be sure that we can determine 
the mitral regurgitation grade. We need to know the mechanism of regurgitation. We want to understand the etiology of MR. We obviously need to know the ejection fraction and the left ventricular dimensions. How accurately can we do that? There's not a lot of data in the literature. There's one paper, again from the Mayo Clinic, um, and this group looked at 377 consecutive patients that happened to have echoes both at an outside lab and at the Mayo lab. Uh, it's a range of outside labs, some accredited, some not. And these researchers were able to review all of the echo images independently and compare the interpretation of the results. And this is a recent study. This, this is not sort of decades old practice. This is contemporary clinical practice in North America. And their findings are astonishing. The authors write in their results that quantification of mitral regurgitation in their own lab and in the outside labs was of suboptimal quality and non-diagnostic in a third of studies. A third of studies. The bar chart on the left shows that in patients that were referred to the echo lab with reports saying that they had less than moderate mitral regurgitation, 40% were read incorrectly when they were re-evaluated by the Mayo echocardiographers. And conversely, in those patients referred with more than moderate regurgitation, there was discrepant finding in about a fifth of patients. The authors write in their results that the planned operation was cancelled. This is the Mayo Clinic. Because the valve lesion was felt to be less than severe. That was in 80% of patients with discordant grading. In 15% of patients with discordant grading, the valve lesion was graded severe by the echocardiogram performed at our institution, which led to an operation that would not have been indicated based on the external interpretation of the study. Now, that's just discordant grading of mitral regurgitation. Let's just look at what was even reported in these echoes. So left ventricular and systolic dimension, not reported in about 10% of cases. LV size not even commented on in 7% of cases. Mitral valve morphology variably reported up to 95% it was present. But the things that determine as surgeons whether we feel confident about operating and repairing these valves in degenerative patients and our ability to identify degenerative patients was not reported in two-thirds of patients. Half of patients in the Mayo Clinic's own lab. So for guideline-based practice, we did accurate assessment of MR grade. That was discordance led to inappropriate surgery in about 15% of patients. The mechanism of MR was not reported in two-thirds of patients. And it, left ventricular dimensions were missing in 10% of patients. So without profound practice improvement, relying on a single echocardiogram to guide the timing of intervention in MR, of MR it certainly in contemporary US practice seems questionable. The other element of these guidelines is obviously this need to be able to sort of state with confidence that you'll be able to safely repair and durably repair a valve with a certainty of 95%. And that is pinned on this concept of reference centers that basically dominate our literature and what's going on in the, in the real, out, out there. And these reference centers report stunning results with operative mortality less than 1%, low stroke rates, very high repair rates with very low residual MR, very low recurrent MR, and low rates of reoperation. What's happening in the real world? Well, I think as Dr. Sitkus alluded to, that there's huge variation. So this is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database analysis done by Jim Gammy. It's quite an old paper, but the results are still pertinent, and they were very similar in his recently updated paper, although he didn't look at this, which is why I'm using this slide in his more recent paper. And the slide is relevant because it shows the huge variation in mortality between centers, with the lower volume centers having up to three times the risk-adjusted operative mortality of the highest volume centers. Similar outcomes for stroke. So already you're seeing that there's a huge variation in operative mortality and stroke, let alone repair rate. So again, Dr. Sitkus showed this slide from the UK database, and this is very similar across Europe. The prevalence of replacement in patients presenting with mitral regurgitation is far higher than ideal. Each red dot in this histogram represents an individual surgeon in New York State. 
There's obviously a far outlier with a high volume and a 100%, well, let's call it a 99% repair rate. But there are a number of high volume surgeons in degenerative disease that are repairing only about 60 or 70% of valves. And the other factor, the durability of their valve repairs, is also very correlated with the volume. So the line in blue represents surgeons that see the mitral valve twice a month or more. And the line in red represents, sorry, less. And the line in red represents surgeons that see the valve twice a month or more often. And the, this is the failure of repair within 12 months of surgery, much, much higher for the lower volume surgeons. So reoperation rates are higher than you would want um, to operate in asymptomatic degenerative patients, and the repair rates are much, much lower. And finally, recurrence rates, again, higher in most um, hands. So I think this push towards early intervention based on single echocardiograms in asymptomatic patients is obviously very swayed by your ability to manage the factors that contribute to the balance of risks in patients. So this vertical line here represents the net health benefit of null to a patient um, undergoing surgery. And the factors that shift you towards the right, i.e. a benefit, are a very low repair mortality, a higher incidence of congestive heart failure if you're observing the patient, a high probability of repair with a very low stroke risk and a very low replacement mortality. You're all familiar with this concept that to improve these results, we should focus on reference centers, sending these simple, straightforward repairs, the isolated posterior leaflet prolapse, single segment, um, to surgeons in the community and referring bileaflet complex prolapse to um, reference centers. I, th I think it's a fallacy. I think it's a fallacy for several reasons. Um, the first one is centered around that series of slides at the beginning that show how difficult it is for echocardiographers, certainly in the US, to provide us with reliable, uh, valid, accurate assessment of mitral valve disease, etiology, severity, let alone mechanisms. And secondly, this chunk of missing data that doesn't allow you to accurately identify the patients that are appropriate for surgery. Tyrone David put it very well in his editorial in JTCVS. He notes that even in socialized medicine, such as operates in England and Canada, this centralization of specialist healthcare services is difficult to achieve because essentially cardiac surgeons believe that they're all entitled to manage and they're all incentivized to manage patients with mitral valve regurgitation. So in conclusion, I don't believe that imaging should dictate the timing of surgery in the real world because of this huge variability in the completeness and accuracy of the echocardiograms we rely on to make our decisions and because of the wild variability in the quality and safety and durability of surgical repair. Slavage adherence to image-based guidelines likely to result in excess, inappropriate and potentially harmful intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. So let's, uh, let's have a comment from Marta on what we just heard. Well, indeed, I am quite happy because um, I definitely agree that a single like, echocardiogram does not make it, but probably uh, good echocardiograms and confirmed echocardiograms do make it, according to your presentation. So in the end, I think we could come up to a, a treat and being in, in accordance, but also if we look at the real world, uh, these centers of excellence are not available everywhere. So we should pursue on improving technical surg uh, techni surgical techniques, but of course also imaging. So I think that this is the, quite the way to go. <laughs> is Maurice in the room? Maurice Serrano? Ah, Maurice, yes. come. So the great thing while Maurice is coming to the, the mic, so Joanna and I have been on the stage together about 15 years or so, and the great thing is she always likes to pick on the Mayo data, but now that I've left Mayo, I can't defend it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Maurice, you're on. No, it's, there is nothing to defend. Is the, uh, is yes, surgeons have to improve. Not all surgeons are equal. Not all doctors are equal. Not all imaging is equal. You have to have the concept of screening echo, a guy is doing echo in, in the community, and he's saying, I see MR, I am alarmed, I'm gonna refer to people to, who know what they're doing. And in the journals, you find a lot of people reporting echoes, and they don't know what they're doing. So as you said for surgery, for echo, it's the same. 
you have to know what you're doing. So screening echo, then referral to a heart team, and then you do the right thing, and you get good results. Beautifully said, Joanna. <laughs> I think where it falls down is on the referral to the heart team. Um, certainly in North American practice, there are very few surgeons that are not incentivized to keep every single patient close to home. Um, and until you address that, then you're going to be stuck with this problem. And, and that's the responsibility. That is the responsibility of the cardiologist, to act with uh, discernment, to say, OK, I have this patient, I'm going to act for the benefit of this patient to choose the person I'm going to refer to, to choose the center I'm going to refer to. The surgeons, they're all waiting and everybody, as a surgeon, can you say I cannot do A or B or C? No, they won't tell you. So we know that and the cardiologists have to say, okay, I know where to refer my patient. And you, we do the same with interventional cardiology, you don't refer to interventional cardiology, you refer to a person who's going to do it right. And so that's, that's the purpose. So us as cardiology, discernment on what we do with echo, discernment on where we refer the patient. The other point, though, is that you don't necessarily want to make echo the hinge point of that discernment. I think refocusing this view on what reference centers should be handling away from echo determinants towards clinical, so you look at the high stakes patients, those are the asymptomatic young patients with probably normal ventricles, and the high risk patients, they're the complex, you know, third time re-op, awful ventricles. Um, that may Don't. be more reproducible than running by a this is This is getting interesting now, yeah, just yeah. as we're about to close the session. <laughs> okay, Maurice, go. Just, uh, um, the, the, uh, again, the, the echo is, is we have to, uh, make the judgment and not focus on, on one thing in the echo and again on, on, on making the assessment and, and sending this patient to, to the right place. The clinical judgment, I, I see a ton of patients, you have the same thing, how are you doing? I'm okay. And uh, what do you have? Three over six murmur, you can't determine anything. In valve disease, everything begins with imaging because the clinical is established as being very weak and, and, and very few high clinicians can do the right thing. And we, the mass of people are not the 50-year-old. Mean age of MR, 73. Treatment in Olmsted County, 85% of patients with MR are never treated for their disease. So our job is to detect these patients and to bring down the under-treatment of MR with every mean we have. That's the job, not to make it perfect for one 50-year-old. We have to make it perfect, but, but that's not the current mission. The current mission is to address the under-treatment of mitral regurgitation, which is massive. Point taken. Uh, Murat Tushu from Cle Cleveland Clinic. Um, I just, for the first statement of Maurice, uh, the responsibility is the cardiologist uh, to get these patients to the right surgeon. I, I just wanted to voice my uh, disagreement with that. Uh, the cardiologists, uh, and together with the surgeons, I think showed the way in uh, the last decade how TAVR should be done. TAVR is done in about 500 centers out of 1,500 centers that do interventions. And, and very strictly regulated uh, based on the quality data that comes out. I don't understand after two decades I've been listening to this, why the surgeons don't get together and then and, and, uh, and change this so that, that we, we really have some incentive to send this or, 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 or obligation to send these patients to, uh, to people who can repair. So I think that I, I, I want to uh, send this back to Morris that it's not only the Oh, perfect. Arnie, do you want to close this? Uh, <laughs> yes, I would like to ask you, uh, John, uh, with the uh, current training um, paradigm in, uh, in the U.S., what do you think is the role of the surgeons uh, for interpretation for echocardiograph? Um, I actually just focus on the current training paradigm for teaching surgeons how to operate on the mitral valve. The ABTS only just introduced a minimum requirement for mitral valve surgery, and it doesn't actually stipulate that a trainee should graduate having performed one single repair. 
So maybe we should start there. Excellent. Uh, Marta? Just a very quick comment because, I mean, absolutely agree with Maurice for sure, but we have to keep in mind that in most of the world we cannot select the surgeon that we are referring. So there's a lot to work on also on public health policies to establish this kind of networks. Maybe in the States you can choose the surgeon, but it's not that everywhere. So I think there's a lot of work and exciting work to do. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all to the, uh, to the audience, to the presenters, to the debaters, and wishing you a, a great rest of the day. Take care.